morning, friends. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Today we light the candle of love, and our Advent reading is done by the Lee family. Micah chapter 5, verses 2, 4, and 5a. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace.
and worship this morning, just one announcement at Christmas Eve services. Please plan to join us virtually at 3, 4, or 5 p.m. We'll have a family-friendly uh, traditional Christmas Eve service about 35 minutes long. We can't wait to worship with you, even in virtual ways. Share it with friends, family, watch it with whoever you're able to spend Christmas Eve with. It's going to be great being together. And as we get to year end, uh, I just want to thank you so much for all of your gifts made this year to Bethany Community Church. It is our year end giving campaign, that time when the extra little gifts help us close the gap and get uh, through the end of 2020. So if possible, consider making a year end gift to Bethany. And there's information on how to give on your screen. Thank you so much for all the ways you've continued to bless our church with acts of service and your financial gifts in this year. And uh, we're just grateful. So so let's, let's pray now for our offering. Jesus, thank you so much for the church and the way in which you call us to give and to serve and to give back because you've given so much to us. And God, we just pray that you would take all of the gifts given and multiply them uh, to our three world partners across our six locations. Uh, God, into this neighborhood for your glory. Thank you so much for the work of Bethany Community Church. In your name we pray, amen. Expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength.
of our complicated world, with full knowledge of our complicated existence, uh, you chose to come and be with us, God incarnate, turning all kingdoms and powers on their heads and changing the trajectory of all humanity. We're so humbled to be the recipients of that gift, the gift of your presence, that you desire to be with us. And so especially this morning, uh, as we enter into your word and learn together, uh, will you be with us and in our hearts that we would respond and that we would leave and go about the rest of our days and into our weeks transformed. We worship you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Good morning, friends. My name is Jordan, and I'm the director of children's ministry. Look at this really cool gift I got. Well, I don't actually know it's a cool gift yet because I haven't opened it, but I think it's going to be really cool because my best friend gave it to me. Here's the thing. She told me I have to wait until Christmas Day to open it. That feels like such a long time to wait. I bet a lot of you have wrapped presents that you can't open until Christmas Day too. Maybe they're sitting under your tree at home and they're just staring at you begging to be opened but you have to wait until Christmas Day. I can get really impatient and it can be so hard to wait sometimes. But it's easier when we're waiting for something like Christmas because we know what day Christmas is so we can count down the days to it. It's a lot harder to wait for something when it's something that's really, really exciting, but you don't actually know when it's gonna happen. Then it's really, really hard to wait because you have no idea how long you're supposed to wait for. And it can be really discouraging because maybe you think it's not gonna come after all, but you just have to keep waiting. There's a couple of people in the Bible who this happened to as well. Their names are Anna and Simeon. Now, they had both waited a really long time for the Savior to come. Now, this is the same Savior we've been talking about all Advent, that God promised to God's people all the way back in the book of Isaiah, and that God's people had been waiting hundreds and hundreds of years for. Now, with Simeon and Anna, they had both waited their whole lives for this Savior to come. While she waited, Anna spent all of her time at the temple, serving and worshiping God. Simeon also worshiped God. And get this, God had promised Simeon 
that he would live to see the Savior himself with his own eyes. How cool is that? Following the prompting of the Holy Spirit one day, Simeon decided to go to the temple. He knew the day had finally come. It was time for him to meet the Savior. But who is the Savior that Anna and Simeon both waited their whole lives to meet? You'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, we have Bible story videos and activities that you can do at home, as well as our kids' Zoom churches that you can join us on Sunday mornings. You can find all of these links on our website. See you next time. Hello, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Raul, and I have the privilege to be able to preach the word this morning and read our scripture. So our scripture comes from Matthew 2, verses 5 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Today's scripture uh, lines up beautifully uh, for uh, the liturgical year. Earlier, we heard uh, a reading from Micah and now from Matthew. Uh, Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we light a candle for the mystery of love. We've lit candles for hope and joy and peace, uh, but today we light a candle for love, and we praise God for the ways that he has fulfilled the covenant of love with us, his bride, through Jesus. It is right and good to compare uh, the church's relationship with God uh, as a marriage, uh, one where the bride is waiting for the return of her groom. We may not always understand it, but God demonstrates over and over that his covenant love is worth waiting and watching for. My hope today is just to to remind you all, to remind us all, that we are loved by the great lover, Jesus Christ, and to not get tired of asking for or expecting the loving gifts that Jesus has to offer to us, his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, and I I thank you for the, the mystery that is love, this active, participating word and work that you do and that you are all about doing uh, with your people, with your creation. We are who you love, and I thank you that that is true. So, Lord God, I pray that uh, uh, any, any hearts that are hardened against your love today, Lord God, for whatever reason, that, Lord God, you would soften it today and that by your spirit uh, you would penetrate uh, hearts and, and help people know your church, that you love us, that you love your bride. Help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me read again that portion of scripture uh, that is a prophecy for today. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. These words originally written by the prophet Micah were written about 800 years before Matthew quotes them uh, in Jesus' day. For 400 of those years, Israel waited and and silently for the word uh, uh, to come to them or for the foretold Savior uh, to show himself. And within that time, that 400 years of silent waiting, some of God's people would live and die without any new revelation or fulfillment of the promise. Waiting, hoping, and praying for the fulfillment, but it wouldn't come to them. I wonder, is this 
the story for some of you too. Have you been waiting and hoping and praying for fulfillment of a promise or a desire, but it hasn't come to pass yet? Has COVID shattered any hope of your promises of being fulfilled? What do you do? What, what have you done? As I am facing this too, I think the hard answer is that we wait. We wait. But in the waiting, we have a choice. We can choose to wait and wither, or we can wait and watch. For many Israelites, they were led by their leaders into waiting and withering by falling into a religious rut. The priests were leading them through the motions of ritual and sacrifice, but, but it was empty. It is reported in Ezekiel that, that while they did this, the presence of God literally left the temple and nobody noticed. They just went on doing what they do. Seemingly from that time, many would wait for the Savior, but wither in their religious rut and lukewarm worship. The Pharisees in the New Testament are a prime example of this. Their faith withered along with their hope in the waiting. But there's a better way to wait. To wait and to watch. We heard in the kid's story of a man named Simeon. His faith had not withered. It says that he was a righteous and devout man, credited to him much like it was to Abraham in Genesis 15. It is perhaps because of this faithful readiness that when Holy Spirit visits Simeon, he has the eyes to see and the ears to hear God. He is told he will see the foretold Savior with his own eyes. I believe that because Simeon was watching in his waiting, he believed spirit and worshiped earnestly in the temple courts as he waited to see God's promise fulfilled. Simeon believed in the covenant of love that God made with his people, and this belief directed him to watch while he waited. In today's story, Herod, the false king, was waiting and withering in false worship of himself, while the Magi were waiting and watching for the promise to be fulfilled of the true king. So the question is, how are you waiting right now? Just after college, uh, I wanted to marry my, my girlfriend, Sarah. Uh, she's not my wife. But there's kind of an arc to the story because uh, when I was ready, I, I was ready, right? And uh, I still did the gentlemanly thing, and I went to, up to Bothell and visited Sarah's parents in their home without telling Sarah, and I asked them, can I marry your daughter? And they didn't say no, but they did give me a qualified yes. And uh, what they told me was, uh, you know, certainly you can do what you want, but if you want our blessing, we want you to wait a year, get to know us more, and go on some adventures with Sarah and just see how you deal with the problems and the challenges that arise when you get out there and get into some challenges. And so I did that, uh, a little begrudgingly. I did that, and I, and I never told Sarah about it until we were engaged, but Here's the thing that it helped me with. It helped me watch for and see the new sides of the love that I felt for her and that I was ready to commit to her. So it helped me watch and see things that I might not have otherwise been looking for. When I have the privilege to marry couples, uh, I have this stock bit about commitment. Now, I think I've experienced that couples feel like they know what they 
think, or they, they probably think that the other thinks what they think about what commitment is, but I find that they kind of have different ideas about it once you start talking about it. So it's important to me that in the ceremony that we actually lay it out and we differentiate between what is a contract and what is a covenant. See, a contract is an arrangement with a set of expectations that if those expectations are not met, then the relationship set on the contract can be canceled, voided. Whereas a covenant, a covenant is a set of commitments each person makes, uh, promises that they, they, uh, they covenant to keep regardless of what the other person does or does not do. So do you see the difference? The, co- the contract is based on performance. The covenant is based on promise alone. It's important to lay this foundation of marriage between people because it's literally a mirror of the foundation that God laid down with God's self and humanity. God made a covenant with us, you and me, the church, to be our loving God no matter what we do. To me, covenant is at the center of the mystery of love. Covenant is at the center of why God uses the weak to confound the strong, the, the, the foolish, to confound the wise when demonstrating uh, God's love and power and presence. That's why God will bring a savior through Bethlehem. You see, in our readings today, Micah writes, though you are small among the clans of Judah, I will. And then in Matthew, uh, he writes, Bethlehem, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Therefore, I will bring a savior through you. The word small or or by no means least they are referring not to uh, like physical stature, they're referring to significance. Bethlehem is considered the least significant among the tribe of Judah who is among all the other tribes. And yet, the Savior will come through them. And that is why God will use Magi, astrologers of no repute in Israel, to confirm the arrival of his Savior. It is because he will use anyone who is waiting and watching for him, especially these men who were looking to the stars for the king of kings. You see, the hope for a savior, for a Messiah, goes way back before there was even an office of king uh, in Israel, before that was even established as an office. The idea of a savior was there. So way before King Saul and 1 Samuel, we're going back to Genesis. A covenant of love where God told Abraham that he would bless him with his presence, with land and many descendants who God would be with, including kings that would come out of Abraham. So God is making a a covenant of love with Abraham. And in Genesis 15, he makes a particular promise to Abraham about children. God takes Abraham outside and he tells him, look, look up in the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. God tells Abraham that it is the stars in the sky, which represent his offspring that will come from him, that demonstrate the fulfillment of this special promise that he's making to him. But what is this special promise? What is this covenant that God is making specifically with Abraham? God covenants to Abraham that even though he's childless at 100, he tells him a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. That's his promise, his covenant to Abraham. His own flesh and blood. Kind of like bread and wine. Perhaps that's why Abraham eats bread and wine with the priest Melchizedek in the chapter before this one. 
Perhaps that's why Jesus is called a priest in the order of Melchizedek because he serves the bread and the wine from his own body and blood. Hmm. But back to the promise that God makes to Abraham. A son in his own flesh and blood. The plain reading of this text is that the son is Isaac, right? The son of promise. But if we zoom out and we look at the, 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 the canonical reading, the, the Genesis to Revelation reading, we see that Isaac was just but a shadow of a fulfillment of this promise, this covenant that God makes with Abraham. A reason the birth of Jesus is signaled with a star in the sky is because Jesus' coming is tied to this particular covenant promise God makes to Abraham back in Genesis. A promise God sealed in the stars. A covenant made to a man about a boy, but it represents the true God and his church. The true fulfillment of the promise of the covenant of love God makes with Abraham is signaled by the brightest star in the sky. Yet it seems only these magi knew it and knew what it meant and that it meant that the promised king was being born right then. A son of God who would come in the flesh and blood of God through the most insignificant people in Israel, Bethlehem. Neither Bethlehem nor the Magi knew that who they were or what they had was important to God because others considered them insignificant. But they submitted what they had, like the widow who gave her two tiny coins and it was all she had, but God considered it to be a fortune that she gave because it was all she had. Here's what I want you to hear in this church. You are the bride of Christ, and your worth and value come from God. You are not to devalue yourselves or any others in the body. Why? Because God loves his bride. And you are all to use all the means that he has blessed you with to love what he loves. The letter to the Ephesians tells husbands, but all of us should hear and understand, that Paul is talking about the profound mystery that is Christ and the church. So he says this, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And didn't God so love the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life? If Jesus went to the cross to fulfill the Father's co love covenant with Abraham, so also we should take every insignificant part of ourselves and submit it to God for his use as we wait and watch for God's love to return to us. Church, Jesus is our North Star, and we, we are his constellations. And though he is brighter than all of us put together, what would the night sky look like without us alighting around him? If any of you listening today desire to know to intimately know the mystery of love, this love of Jesus Christ, and you have yet to know him. I would invite you now as we pray and we close and, and, and move into a time of worship that you would pray with me and just repeat this prayer after me, inviting Jesus to be your North Star, inviting Jesus to be your Savior. Heavenly Father, I am ready. I repent of my sins. 
I turn away from my old life. I desire the love of Jesus. I confess Jesus is Lord and Savior. I surrender my life to him. Be my Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time and this day. I thank you for the fourth Sunday of of Advent where we get to celebrate the mystery of your love, the wonder of your love. Father God, I pray again and and pray that uh, your word would would prick the hearts of stone that have uh, uh, kept you out of any place in their heart and life. Because Lord God, I believe you are good. I believe you are good and that your love is not coercive, but just wooing. You love us and you desire all of us. So Lord God, I pray that those hearing today uh, would come before you as we prepare to celebrate the, the, the birth and the, and the coming of your Savior. I pray that that would not just be an idea, but that would be a reality in our lives again for as long as we've been believers or even new believers, that we would submit our hearts and our lives to you anew so that you may fill us and you may be uh, the groom of the church and we may be your bride. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Like the frost on a rose Winter comes for us all Oh, our nature acquaints us With the nature of patience Like a seed in the snow Time you could have saved us in a second. 
Looking forward to worshiping together with you on Christmas Eve. We know that we would like to be together in person, but we have the opportunity across the city to light candles and declare our unity, declare our faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you. As is fitting, as we talked about marriage today, I'd like to read this over you and remind us of what love is. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So go knowing that the love of God will never fail you. And you can give it out to those around you in worship of God. Amen. Go in peace.